Pitch to Donnie Rouse, the catcher, Johnny Bunch, the first baseman, Tony Perez, the second baseman, Joe Morgan, the shortstop, Dave Concepcion, the third baseman, Pete Rose, the left fielder, George Buster, the center fielder, Cesar Geronimo, the right fielder, Ken Griffin, and the pitcher, Gary Dolan. Concepcion, pinch hitting for Pedro Bourbon, and here's Mike Marshall's first pitch plate work. Swung on, a looper, left center field, a base hit, here comes Cheney, the throw to the plate, and this one belongs to the Reds. The 1975 baseball season truly did belong to the Cincinnati Reds. Cincinnati's big red machine rolled to 108 regular season victories, the third highest total in National League history. Sparky Anderson's crew followed with a sweep of the Pittsburgh Pirates in the championship series, and then came the exciting World Series, a seven-game showdown with the Boston Red Sox. Many observers called it the most exciting World Series on record, as the Reds won Game 7 with a thrilling come-from-behind victory that gave Cincinnati its first World's championship in 35 years. It was a great season from start to end, from a three-game sweep of the arch-rival Los Angeles Dodgers in the year's first series, to the victory over Boston in the final game of the year. It was a season full of record-breaking events and electrifying moments. The Cincinnati march to the World Championship was a team effort all the way. And this is a story. This one belongs to the Reds. Through the first month of the season, the Reds were hardly better than a 500 club, winning 12 of 23 games in the month of April. It was time to make a move, and what a move it was. Not only did the Reds move up in the standings, but Sparky Anderson made a move on the field that shocked everyone. Pete Rose became the Reds' third baseman. He hadn't played the infield since 1965, but from the very beginning, it was apparent that Pete felt right at home at the hot corner. And the 1-1 pitch. That is bounced to third. Pete Rose backs up, makes the play, throw to first, he got him. All right. There isn't a more exciting or dangerous player in the major leagues than Joe Morgan. He's a power hitter, demonstrated by his 17 home runs and 94 RBIs. He hits for an average, too, as his 327 mark attested. He has the best batting eye in the game, represented by his league-leading 132 walks. And he has flying feet, as he ranks second in the league in stolen bases with 67. Joe was a National League's Player of the Month in April and June. He's a game-breaker, and this score against the Giants at Riverfront points that out solidly. Williams with a 3-2 on the way. Swung on, line drive, right center field. It'll be in for a hit. Field it on one big hop. Here comes Morgan to second. Hit first, sliding safe. Joe Morgan never broke stride as Gary Maddox drifted deep in the right center to feel that big hopping line shot. And Joe with a head first slide in safely with a two-base hit. That one bounces up there. Can't find it, Hill. Here comes Morgan to third. It gets by the catcher. The third baseman and Morgan will score, and this one belongs to the Rats. Well, the ball got away from Mark Hill. He couldn't find it. Morgan broke for third. Hill picked it up and threw it away at third base at getting down the line away from Oliveros. And Morgan scores to give the Reds a 5-4 to four victory. Johnny Bench remained one of baseball's most prolific home run hitters and run producers in 1975, finishing second in the major leagues with 110 runs batted in. Home runs like this one off Alan Foster helped Johnny move into that spot. Strike one delivery. Bench fly ball, deep left field, looking up, it is gone! A grand slam home run for Johnny Bench, the first of the year for a Cincinnati Red and the Reds have bolted out in front, eight to two. Yet things were not right for the big red machine. On May 21st, the record stood at just 21 and 21, and the Reds were five and one half games behind the Dodgers in the National League Western Division race. On that night, however, Mets manager Yogi Berra gave his ace Tom Seaver the baseball, and the Reds' offense went wild. Tony Perez and rookie Doug Flynn hammered home runs as the Reds scored a whopping 11 to four victory. Seaver, a backward glance at bench. Long pause, looking again, the pitch. Here's a drive, left field, Milner back, he's looking, it's gone. Ready again with the next pitch. Swung on, hammered to deep left field, it is going to be a home run for Doug Flynn. Doug Flynn on a 3-1 pitch, hammers one out of here to left field. His first major league home run, and it's 11-4 Cincinnati. 
That win was a big one. It started one of the most fantastic streaks in Major League history. The victory was the first of 41 in the next 50 games for the Big Red Machine. By the All-Star game, the Reds had vaulted 12 and one-half games in front of the Dodgers and were racing away toward their fourth division championship in the last six years. Everyone contributed, as evidenced by this big hit off the bat of Merv Redman. The 0-1 to Merv, swung on, a base hit center field. Here's Concepcion, here comes Foster. Redman with a two-run single and the count goes to 5-0. The Reds were great in the clutch in 1975, winning 28 games in their final time at bat. One of them was May 24, when Joe Morgan's 11th inning single defeated the Phillies. McGraw has a sign from Bob Boone. He kicks and fires. Morgan line Mark drive, base hit right field, and this one belongs to the ref. Cincinnati depended heavily on its bullpen in 1975. Veterans Clay Carroll and Pedro Bourbon combined with youngsters Raleigh Eastwick and Will McEnany to give the Reds the best relief corps in the National League. Eastwick, who didn't join the Reds until mid-May, earned 22 saves in a sensational rookie season and tied Al Roboski of St. Louis for the league lead. This was one of them. Harmon at third, Luzinski at second, Ollie Brown at first. A ball and two strikes on Mike Schmidt with the Phillies trailing 4-2. Eastwick had glanced to third again and onto the plate. Strike three, swing, and he got it. What a job. It was grand slam time again for Johnny Bench on May 26 against Montreal. He had his sixth career bases loaded home run off Don DeMola, tying Beta Pinson for the club record. Now the 1-0. Swung on, a fly ball, a deep left field. It is going to be a grand slam home run. Johnny Bench has just clubbed his 10th home run of the year, his second grand slam of the year, and the Reds have gone out in front 5-4. to four. Gary Nolan was a comeback kid for the Reds in 1975. He led the staff in innings pitched and tied for the most victories with 15. One of those wins was a two-hit shutout over Montreal on May 28th. His first shutout since June of 1972, and a victory that kept the Reds' winning streak alive. Mike Jorgensen, the batter. He hits a line shot. Morgan backhands in the hole, throws to Dreesen, and this one belongs to the Reds. Gary Nolan with an out-of-sight pitching performance tonight as he goes the distance for the fourth time. His first shutout, and the Reds have their seventh consecutive victory. The Reds went into first place for good in 1975 on June 7th with a win over Chicago. They moved four percentage points ahead of the Dodgers that day and were never headed as they won the division by 20 games, becoming the first team since 1906 to win by that large a margin. Cincinnati enjoyed tremendous success against the Cubs, winning 11 of the 12 games between the two teams. Included was a four-game sweep at Riverfront June 6th, 7th, and 8th. First, a big base hit by Dave Concepcion. One man out, the pitch, swung on a base hit left field. Right by the third baseman, rolling in beyond the Cub bullpen. Bench is in, Dreesen is in, and the Reds lead it 5-1 to one on, boy, a clutch double by Concepcion. Then back-to-back -back home runs by Johnny Bench and Dan Dreesen. Barris is 1-1, is swung on, hammered to deep left center field. He hit it a bunch. Back is Monday. it's gone. Swung on, a fly ball, hit deep and high to right center. It might be back-to-backers. It is. And the pitching was excellent. Billingham throwing, and Thornton ground ball to shortstop. Concepcion has it, his running throw, and this one belongs to the Reds. The Reds' pitching continues to be out of sight. The final score today as Billingham goes the distance, giving him a run on five hits. The Reds eight, the Cubs one. Bench continued to play long ball. And the 1-1. One -one. Bench swings and hits it deep to left field. Stay fair. Baseball gone. But Johnny Bench rips one down the left field line. And I mean an absolute shot. The Reds lead it 2-1. Time after time, the Reds' strong bench paid dividends. Watch 3-2 pitch. Grounded right side and through for a base hit. Ball just pass him out and out of the reach of Manny Trio on into center field. Redman's first hit in the game. Checking the pitch, Redman goes, pitch is swung on, popped up, looped in the shallow, left to hit for Plummer. Redman at third, Plummer at second. None out, 1-1 one, one the count on Crowley. Here's a pitch. Swung on, hit into left field, it is a base hit. 
One run will score. Here's Plummer coming on to third, sliding safely, and Crowley with a pitch single to left makes it 5-3 our side. The ace of the pitching staff was left-hander Don Gully. And during the amazing streak of successes in late May and early June, he piled up the victories, earning his eighth on June 11. Ground ball, right side, Flynn has it. His throw to Perez, and this one belongs to the Reds. And the final score tonight as Gullet wins his eighth of the season, the Reds three, the Cardinals one. Win number nine for Gullet was also an eye popper on June 16th. But as things turned out, it was to be his last victory for a long while. The pitch, smash off the pitcher's mound, now recovered by Cheney, throwing to first to get the out. As one run scores, that ball hit Don Gullet, and he's down and writhing just off to the right of the mound. The injury was a broken left thumb, and it set him to the sidelines for two months. But the big red machine kept on rolling. Last at-bat victories became the trademark for this ball club, such as these on June 27th and June 28th. Here's a long drive to deep right field, and this one belongs to the Rats. A three-run home run by Danny Dreesen into the green seats in right field. And the Reds have ended it with lightning-like swiftness here in the bottom of the 11th inning. The final score, 5-2 to two Cincinnati. Morgan at second base with two away. 2-2 two -two on the way. Curve swung on. It's all over, I think. Going back and Yachty has just put one in the green seat. The Reds won it by a score of 6-4. to four. Ken Griffey blossomed into a star in 1975, batting 305. One of the fastest players in baseball, Griffey had 38 infield hits during the season and used his swift feet to rank among the triples leaders in the National League. This one helped the Reds draw close. Foster third, Armbrister second, Rose at first. Three balls and two strikes on Griffey. One man out, the left-hander stretches and delivers. Here's a fly ball, hammer to left field, gross well, not be able to get it, and it goes all the way to the wall. Three runs are going to score. Griffey comes to third, and it's six to five. And this shot won it. We're tied six to six in the 12th inning. Negro sets and delivers. Ben swings, hits it, that's all. Johnny Benz, his 16th home run of the year, and the Reds win it by a score of nine to six. Let me say this, this one belongs to the Reds. A day later, the Reds were victorious again in extra innings as Joe Morgan wore the laurel of hero. Rose out at second base, representing the winning run. The pitch to Morgan. Swung out, a base hit to right center field. Here comes Pete Rose, and this one belongs to the Reds. Joe Morgan has ended it here in the 15th inning with a base hit to right center field. And in the longest game of the year for the Cincinnati Reds, they win 8-7 and 15 over the Houston Astros. Long home runs were especially of George Foster and Tony Perez. George smacked 23 after taking over the regular left field spot on May 3rd when Pete Rose was moved to third base. He connected for a long one against the Astros in late June. Now Foster waiting. Swings and there it goes! A long drive to left field! It is a home run! George Foster pounding one into the yellow seats in left field, two rows deep. A three-run blast on Durker's first pitch, and the Reds are up a run, four to three. And then Tony Perez pounded a prodigious shot against the Philadelphia Phillies. Here comes a 3-2 pitch to the plate. It is swung on and hit deep to left field. A tremendous shot to left. It will be in the red seat. A two-run homer for Tony Perez. And that ball went into the red seat to left field. A tremendous shot by Tony Perez. It finds its way into the red seats in left field. And you can count on one hand the number of times that has been done in this stadium since it opened back in 1970. Well, I think you would have to sit here and safely say that he got all of that one. <laughs> Just as impressive as the long home runs were the defensive gems turned in by the 1975 Reds. Cincinnati set a major league record playing 15 consecutive games without making an error. And the Reds made the fewest errors in the major leagues. Defensive plays like these were repeated time after time. Line drive, right field, Rattenman will make a diving catch! What a fine defensive play by Merv Rettman as he went sprawling on the AstroTurf, made the catch and hung on to save two runs and end the inning.
Cruz swings, hits a fly ball in the right center field. Geronimo coming hard, and this one belongs to the ref. Pitch to Maddox, swung on a line drive. Morgan has it. Super play by Joe Morgan on a line shot. He dove off to his left and came up with a ball, and the Reds are home free. Now the 3-2 pitch with John Stone breaking. Swung on ground ball to Pete's left. He dives, comes up with it. Now the throw, he got it. Fine play. Swung on a bouncing ball. Rose cuts it off. Throws to second. Morgan to first. We got a double play. Boy, I'll tell you, fine play right there. Pitch to him. Swung on. A fly ball hit back into deep left field. Foster back on the track. Leaps up, and he makes a catch. Here's a runner completely on the other side of second. The throw to Morgan, the throw to Tony, a double play. The Reds streaked on into July and held a commanding lead over the Dodgers, and more than 150,000 were on hand for a three-day weekend series with Los Angeles at Riverfront, hoping for Cincinnati victories. It was one of the most rousing series of the year. Rose, who led the league in doubles for the second straight year and went back over the 300 mark in 1975, added to the excitement in this series. A thrill a minute. Marshall ready with the one-two, and here she comes. Screwball swung on, there she goes. That's number five for Pete Rose. Get out of here. All right, so Pete Rose gets on a high screwball, and for Pete, his fifth home run of the year, and the Reds lead it now by a score of five to three. How about that? And the fans went home happy thanks to Raleigh Eastwick. Raleigh Eastwick will come on and face Ken McMullen. Strike his call on the outside corner. Here's a pitch. Swing and a miss. Strike two. He struck him out swinging, and this one belongs to the Reds. A preview of the National League Championship Series saw the Reds sweep four games from the Pittsburgh Pirates during a mid-August series at River Front. Foster got the Reds off and running in the first game. He hit two home runs off Pittsburgh ace Jerry Royce. Here's a high fly ball hit back into deep left field. Going back is this, and it is gone. A home run. George Foster hit a mile-high drive to left field and hit off the facing of the green seats. And we bolt down in front of the Pirates 3 to nothing. Here's a man who's put the runs on the board, George Foster. A three-run home run to left field back in the fourth inning. Here's a pitch. Swung on, and there it goes again. A home run to left field. That went into the green seats, and the second home run of the night for George Foster at 5 nothing. The Reds continued their onslaught against the Pirates the next night with a big first inning. Back with a 1-0, Rose, a line drive hit the center field. Rooker picks up a strikeout against Ken Griffey. He'll be working to Joe Morgan. Fly ball, right center, get down. It's a base hit. It bounds by the right fielder, Parker. Here's Rose rounding third. He's coming to the plate. No throw, and a game is tied at one apiece. Bench swings, hits hey, a fly ball to right field. Let's hit a ton. Back is Parker. It's going a home run. Here's Tony. Break even pitch. Swung on and a line shot hit to left field. That ball is going to go all the way to the wall. Here's Zisk up throwing. Tony digging for second. He is in standing with a double. Two balls, one strike. As pitcher faces pitcher. Base is loaded, two out. Rooker ready with a pitch. That is swung on, hit on the right field, a base hit. Tony Perez is in. Foster to the plate. Going to third is Glenn and Fred Norman with a two-run single sends the Reds up five to one. The pitch to him swung on a smash to left center field. That's another base hit. In the score is Glenn coming to third, getting the green light now. The stop sign is Norman. Rose has had his second hit of the inning. Another run is home at six to one. Perez helped make it three straight the next day with a game-winning home run. And then in the series finale, it was Pete Rose who stole the show. 2,499 career hits. The pitch by Keeson. It's swung on. There it is. A base hit to center field. A feed rose with number 2,500. He gets an RBI on it and a standing ovation from this capacity house here at Riverfront. Don Gullett, who would have undoubtedly crashed the 20 victory circle for the first time without his injury, still wound up with 15 victories and a glittering earned run average of 2.42. He made a strong comeback from his broken thumb as this shutout against the Cardinals on August 28th demonstrates. Here's a 1-1 pitch to Rudolph. Swung on and a fly ball to right. Griffey moving deep and this one belongs to the ref. Fine five-hit shutout by left-hander Don Gullett as the Reds defeat the Cardinals in the first of four 
four to nothing. There's no finer center fielder in the game than Cesar Geronimo. He's a gold glover on defense, and with a bat, he contributed some big base hits. Geronimo swings, it's a fly ball to right field. That's hit deep. Davis is back, and it's out of here, a home run. Cesar Geronimo jumping on Lynn McLaughlin's first pitch. He took him deep to right field, and just like that, the Reds lead it 4-1. to one. RBIs are synonymous with Tony Perez. For the ninth consecutive year, he exceeded the 90 mark in runs batted in, and for the third straight season, he passed his century mark with 109. He also reached a big RBI milestone in his career on September 2nd against San Diego's Jerry Johnson. Perez waiting on the 2-0 pitch to the plate. He hits a base hit to left field. Geronimo scores, and Tony Perez is the all-time RBI leader in Cincinnati Reds history. His 1,010th as they come to their feet with a standing ovation here at Riverfront Stadium. A record-setting club all season long, it was only appropriate the Reds establish another mark when they clinched the Western Division title on September 7th. By winning that day, the Reds clinched earlier than any club in National League history. And the 8-4 victory, coupled with a Los Angeles Dodger loss in Atlanta, touched off the clubhouse celebration. The Reds kept on rolling through September. They set a National League record for most home wins with 64 and finally chalked up win number 108 on the final day of the season. The season ended like it began. A come-from-behind victory and an infield hit that knocked in the winning run. Odell Canton battling to send the game into extra innings. Comes with the 0-1. It's swung on a grab right. ball. Hit. Diving play. He'll not have a play. And this one belongs to the Reds. A hard ground ball hit off to the right of Larvell Blanks. He dove for it, got his glove on the ball. The ball skidded loose. Blanks scampering after it to try and make a play, but could not. And the Reds have pulled it out here in the ninth inning, 7-6. to six. No doubt about it, this one belonged to the Reds. The battle cry now, though, was bring on the Pirates. The 1975 National League Western Division champion Cincinnati Reds are on the air. The 75 League Championship Series with Marty Brenneman and Joe Luxall. Reds baseball is brought to you by Stroh's Beer for 200 years. From one beer lover to another. And by the Marathon Oil Company. People who believe in people. By the Pepsi-Cola Bottling Company of Cincinnati. Bottlers of Pepsi-Cola, Dr. Pepper, and Schweppes products. By Frisch's. At breakfast time, lunch time, or any time you're hungry, there's always a Frisch's nearby. By the First National Bank of Cincinnati. The bank that adds top security to high interest on your savings. And by Riverside Ford in Newport. A block and a bridge from downtown Cincinnati. Now, for all the play-by-play -play action of the Cincinnati Reds Championship Series, we go to Marty Brenneman and Joe Luxall. So now it was on to the playoffs against the heavy-hitting Pittsburgh Pirates. For the Cincinnati Reds, this was their fourth trip to postseason play in the last six seasons. But this time, it just seemed it was to be their year. As usual, Reds fans supported their team enthusiastically, to the tune of 2.3 million. And by the time the playoffs rolled around, the Reds' front office was so inundated with playoff applications that they had to return 30,000 checks for ticket requests. Game one of the playoffs opened at Cincinnati's Riverfront Stadium. Don Gullett and Jerry Royce hooking up in a battle of left-handers. The Pirates scored first, picking up two runs in the second. But the Reds came back with one of their own in the bottom half of the inning. And then in the third, the Reds went in front to stay. 2-2 on the way. Griffey swings and hits it well into right center field. Chasing it down. Now Oliver looking up. It's off the line. Red run scores. The Reds are now third. He'll score and the Reds lead it 4 to 2 Reds struck for another beginning in the fifth, scoring four times to give themselves an 8-1 to one lead. One of the big hits of the inning, and a big surprise, was a two-run homer by pitcher Don Gullett. So the Reds have gotten two more runs across in the fifth inning to make it a 6-2 ball game. Gullett has singled a run across. He has hit a fly ball to right. Okay, Demery delivers. Gullett swings, hits a fly ball. Back hey. to the left field. Ricky hey. is going back. Yeah. Ricky got and is gone. A home run. Don Gullett with a two-run home run to left field. 
Reds coasted from that point on to an eventual 8-3 victory. Game two was also a matchup of left-handers, as Fred Norman of the Reds opposed Jim Rooker. The Reds struck early with Tony Perez's first inning home run. Perez with a fly ball, deep left field. Back is this, and it's gone, a home run. Tony Perez hammers a 1-1 pitch out of here to give the Reds a 2-0 lead. Then in the fourth, the Reds scored two more times as they continued to make the playoffs a nightmare for Pirate catcher Manny Sanguian. 1-0 pitch, swung on, a looper back behind second, Stennett going out, coming in, it falls for a base hit. Right. And now putting on the brakes is Foster as he started to go to second, thought better of it, as Frank Tavares quickly recovered and went to the second base bag to cover. He deals a 2-0 pitch, and that swung on and looped into right center field. Oliver and Parker coming together. It'll end be in for a hit. Here's Foster going to second and holding there as the Reds have dumped a couple into the outfield off of Jim Rooker here in the fourth inning and have two men on and nobody out. Here's a pitch to Griffey. He bounces one left side. It's going to be in for a hit. Here comes Foster. Here comes this throw to the plate. It is not in time, and it's 3-1. Rooker against Fred Norman with runners at second and third, one out. He pitches. Norman hits one into left field. Richie Ziss digging for it. He'll make the catch, but here comes Concepcion. The race is on, and it's four to one. Murphy with one foot on the carpet, one foot in the sliding pit. There he goes. Ball butted through. Sanguian high throw, no. Has eight stolen bases for the Reds in the series. Hebner looking for a bunt, so too is Stargell. He squares. He bunts through it. Throw to second. Here comes Griffey to third, and he's in. Well, it looked like they had him picked off the second base. But as soon as Sanguian fired that way, Kenny came on to third, and that's another steal. Eason has the sign, the stretch. There goes Morgan. The pitch is high and inside. No chance for Sanguian at all. Joe Morgan with his fourth stolen base in a championship playoff series. That is number nine for the ball club and number six here in the ball game. The Reds struck again for single runs in the sixth and seventh on their way to an eventual six to one win. Meanwhile, Raleigh Eastwick took over in the seventh and just sawed off the Pirates' bats, retiring nine of the last ten batters. Two men out. Richie Ziss taking his lead at second base. The 1-0 pitch swung on and popped up outside of first. Tony may have a play. He's over. He's under. And this one belongs to the Reds. With the Reds ahead two games to none, the scene shifted to Pittsburgh's Three Rivers Stadium. On the verge of elimination, the Pirates gave it a valiant fight, as rookie left-hander John Candelaria proved near invincible over the first seven and two-thirds innings, as he struck out a record 14 batters and yielded but one hit. However, that one hit was a second inning home run by Dave Concepcion. Swung out, fly ball, hit back into left field. Richie yeah. just going back. Yeah. It's going a home run. Davey Concepcion is taking Candelaria deep to left field with two out here in the second. And the Reds have gone out in front one nothing. Pittsburgh took a 2-1 to one lead in the sixth on an Al Oliver home run, and things looked good for the Pirates. But in the eighth inning, Candelaria's charm life came to an end as he walked Merv Rettman and had to face always tough Pete Rose. Rettman leading at first base. Candelaria pitches to Rose. One on fly ball, left field. Well hit. It's got a chance. The Reds go out in front three to two. Pete Rose has just taken Candelaria into the seats in left field with Rettman on base, and the Reds have bolted out in front by a score of three to two. However, the Pirates refused to quit and came back to tie it in the ninth. But their newfound light was too short-lived as Ken Griffey opened the tenth with one of his specialties, an infield hit, and eventually scored what proved to be the winning run on rookie Ed Armbrister's sacrifice fly. Oh, and to the count on Griffey. He bunts one out in front of the plate. Here's Sanguian up with it. Throws to first, not in time, and Kenny has a bunt single. The 0-1 delivery, swung on and hit in the air to center field. That's going to be deep enough to get Griffey in. Here's Oliver with a catch. Here's Kenny tagging. Here comes Oliver's throw. It'll be cut off by Randolph, and we go out in front 4-3. A sacrifice fly to center field by Ed Armbrister, and you cannot ask for any more than that. And the Reds were not through. With two out, Pete Rose and Joe Morgan collaborated to add an important insurance run. The 1-1 pitch. Swung on and looped to right field. That will be a base hit.
Pete has his second straight hit, a wrong field single to right. The 2-0 pitch. Swung on and hit hard to right center field. That ball is going to be through and all the way to the wall. Now Pete's got to get to the plate. Up for the ball is Oliver. He throws to Randolph. His throw to the plate. It'll not be in time. It's 5-3 and Pete is in with a run as Morgan goes to third. Then in the bottom of the 10th, Pedro Bourbon emerged from the bullpen to wrap up Cincinnati's eighth National League pennant. Randolph, right-handed batting rookie infielder. Petey looking for the side. He kicks and deals. The pitch is hit to Morgan. He's up. He throws to Tony. And the 1975 pennant belongs to the Rats. Joe Morgan, my man, <laughs> Joe, congratulations, partner. It's a great feeling. It's right. It's unbelievable, Joe. You know, I, I really feel good myself because I feel like I've helped the guys this time. Georgie, boy, Sparky the White Fox, uh, certainly this ball club, uh, well, what can you say about it other than it's super? It's a super baseball team. Boston must be super, Joe, but I'm not going to be naive. To me, this is the best baseball team I have had the privilege of seeing in my career. I just hope that we can win the World Series so that then they can compare these guys and judge these guys the way they should be judged. In the background, the renowned Johnny Betts. And, John, congratulations. Thank you very much, Marty. So far, an unbelievable season for this baseball team. And I guess uh, as one of the team leaders, it would be awfully difficult to pinpoint one key to the success of this team in 75. Well, I think it's the fact that uh, everybody had one goal when they left spring training. And everybody was going to sacrifice to, to no end as much as they could in order to win. So we had a goal in spring training to go all the way, and it's just turned out that uh, two steps were there, and now it's three. Well, they're celebrating, and rightly so, because the Reds have become the National League champions tonight with a 10th inning 5-3 to three victory over the Pittsburgh Pirates, and a man who really went to cranking on John Candelaria in the 8th inning with a two-run home run that put the Reds out in front. Pete had capped off a great, great year for you in 75. Well, thank you, Marty, and I was happy to get that base hit off him because it was the first one I got off my mall here. And he really pitched a great ball game. Uh, you, you can't take anything away from him. He pitched as good a ball game against us tonight as any left hander all year. And uh, somebody had to win, somebody had to lose. And I'm just happy that we won it and they scored a couple in the with the National League pennant safely tucked away in their hip pocket for the third time in the last six seasons, the Reds journeyed to Boston for the start of the World Series against the Red Sox. It had been a long 35 years since the Reds last wore the crown of world champions, and they were determined that this would be the year. But after the first game of the World Series, Reds fans had to be wondering as Louis Tion whirled his magic and shut out the Reds 6-0. Game two looked like more of the same. Left-hander Bill Lee held the Reds at bay for eight innings. But after a slight rain delay late in the game, the Reds regrouped themselves for one of their frantic ninth-inning finishes. Johnny Bench started things by ignoring Fenway Park's famed left field wall by taking Bill Lee to the opposite field. Number five, Johnny Bench. They have the shift on coin. They give him the right field corner with a wind blowing in. I wouldn't be surprised if he can to see him try right center or go to the right field corner, Marty. Let's see what happens. Depends how Lee pitches him. And there he goes to right field. He hits the ball into the corner. He's going to get extra bases. Bench goes into second, and the Reds have the tying run at second. Nobody out. Then after two were out, Dave Concepcion and Ken Griffey combined to give Cincinnati the lead. In comes Drago. There's a bounding ball. It's going to be maybe a tie game. It is. Bench scores, and Concepcion beats out an infield hit to tie it up for Cincinnati. Danny Doyle. Flag it down and back a second, and the Reds have tied it. The one-two pitch. Griffey has a drive in the left center. That's in the gap. Concepcion scoring. Griffey's going to second, and the Reds take the lead, three to two, with a two-run ninth inning. And then Raleigh Eastwick emerged from the bullpen to preserve Cincinnati's first win of the 1975 World Series. Here's the pitch. He pops it up. This should be the ball game. Waiting for it is Concepcion. And he has it. And the Reds win 3-2 to two and tie the series at one game apiece. And the Reds now go home in their own ballpark Tuesday night. A brilliant relief effort by Raleigh Eastwick. Much of the pre-series speculation centered around Boston's Fenway Park and its band box dimensions. However, the heavy hitting did not start until game three of the series when the scene shifted to much more spacious Riverfront Stadium. In all, six home runs were hit in the game by six different players. Boston's catcher Carlton Fisk started things by hitting a solo shot in the second. But in the fourth, his counterpart, Johnny Bench, 
did him one better by belting a two-run shot that gave the Reds a two-to-one lead. And a roaring here with the unlikely sight of Tony Perez stealing second. Two down. That wakes the Red fans up. A pitch. Hit the high, deep to left. Going, going, going. That was the first hit for Cincinnati. And they have the lead, two to one. Johnny Pinch is third World Series homer. In the fifth inning, Dave Concepcion and Cesar Geronimo hit back-to-back home runs for the first time since the 1967 World Series. He hits one a time back in the left center field. Looking up is Jastrzemski and Tommy. Home run. David Concepcion is making the grand tour as he takes Rick Wise downtown. With a shot to left center field. And now the Reds go out in front three to one. Wise needs a strike. Geronimo a pitch away from a walk. He swings. He hits one back in the deep right field. Going back is Evans. And it's out of here. putting on a long ball exhibition here as they have had three hits off Rick Wise and all of them home runs. However, the Red Sox would not quit as pinch hitter Bernie Carbo homered in the seventh and Dwight Evans tied the game with a two-run poke in the ninth. But despite all the long ball heroics, this game would be decided on a ball that traveled no more than two feet and provided much discussion as to how to interpret the baseball rule book. So with Geronimo having let off the 10th inning with a base hit to right center field, Ed Armbrister will be the pinch hitter for Raleigh Eastwick. Right hander Jim Willoughby into his stretch motion as he checks the runner at first base. Here's a pitch to the plate. Armbrister squares around to bunt, drops it out in front of the plate. Carlton Fisk up with the ball, taking a shot at second base, and he throws it away. Geronimo heading for third. Lynn throws that way, but not in time, and Armbrister goes to second. And now Darrell Johnson is out, charging plate umpire Larry Barnett, and he may be arguing interference against Armbrister. There may have been some contact between Carlton Fisk and Armbrister at the plate. A drawn in Boston Red Sox defense. And left-hander Roger Moret will work out of the stretch. As a sign from Carlton Fisk, he comes set. He delivers Morgan with a line drive. Center field. It's over the head of Freddie Wynn. And this one belongs to the Reds. But the Red Sox weren't quitters. And they showed the stuff they were made of when they came back the next night to even the series by beating the Reds 5-4. The last baseball game to be played at Riverfront Stadium in 1975 took place on Thursday, October 16th, as Don Gullett dazzled the Red Sox, and the Reds took a 3-2 lead in the series with a 6-2 win. The Red Sox jumped to an early 1-0 lead, but in the fourth, Tony Perez, who was 0-15 for 15 in the series up to that point, broke out of his slump. And in the fifth, Gullett and Pete Rose combined to put Cincinnati ahead to stay. There's a base hit up the middle. Gullett is on. The fourth hit off Cleveland, a two-out single. And the pitch to Rose, fly ball down the left field line. Curving, it is going to be a fair ball. Gullett rounds third, comes to the plate. He will score, and the Reds go ahead 2-1. to one. Double for Pete Rose. Then in the sixth, the Reds broke the game wide open on Perez's second home run of the night. Bench is at second, Morgan at third, and nobody out. Tony leveling the bat, waiting for Cleveland's pitch. Here it comes. Fly ball, long drive to left field. Tony Perez breaking out of his series slump for the bang. The Reds had on another run in the eighth as Don Gullett pitched masterfully including a stretch where he retired 16 consecutive batters. However, Gullett tired in the ninth as the Red Sox mustered a rally. But out of the bullpen came Raleigh Eastwick to put out the fire. The 0-2 delivery. Here it comes. Strike three. Swinging. The ball game's over. Raleigh Eastwick throws three pitches to Petroselli, nailing it down for Don Gullett as the Cincinnati Reds romp over the Red Sox in game five. So now it was back to Boston in game number six one of the most dramatic contests in baseball history. The Red Sox jumped to a quick 3-0 lead in the first inning when Fred Lynn caught hold of a Gary Nolan pitch and sent it soaring into the right field bleachers. But the Reds came back with three of their own in the fourth inning to knock the score. 
In the seventh, Ken Griffey, Joe Morgan, and George Foster combined to put the Reds in front five to three. Chaos delivery. Big bounding ball hit in the right field by Griffey. That's the third time he's been on. Deion throws, and there's a drive in the left field. That'll be out in the corner. Dostremski racing over and holds Griffey at second base. Again, Tion to the stretch. There goes Morgan. That's a fly ball to deep center. Lynn going back, back. That ball is off the wall. It'll score two runs. Foster's in the second, and Foster has doubled off the stop of the center field wall and nearly had a home run. And the Reds, with superior right-handed power tonight, are using Fenway Park better than the hometown Red Sox. So the Reds now lead 5-3. to three. And in the eighth, Cesar Geronimo appeared to put the game out of reach with his solo shot. Geronimo hits a high drive down the right field line. That one's deep, and it is a home run for Cesar Geronimo. Right down the line it went and dropped into the right field grandstand. And the Reds now lead 6-3. to three. But the Red Sox would not quit. In the eighth inning, Bernie Carbo came back to haunt his old ball club with a game-tying and record-tying pinch hit home run. Carbo hits a high drive, deep center, way back, home run! Bernie Carbo is hitting a second pinch hit home run of this series. That was a blast up in the center field bleachers. It came with two outs and a count two and two. And the Red Sox have tied it six to six. In the bottom of the ninth, it looked like the Red Sox would win it. Bases loaded, none out, but George Foster made a super defensive play. The Reds have the infield in, the outfield, very shallow, and the pitch. There's a high fly ball down the left field line. It's going to be close. It is caught by Foster. Here's a tag, here's a throw. He's out! A double play! A double play! Foster throws him out! Foster took that ball, jammed right up against the left field stands, very shallow, and they sent the runner from third. And Denny Doyle is thrown out on a perfect strike. This was just not to be the Reds' night. In the 11th, they appeared on their way to victory when Joe Morgan sent a deep drive to right field, but Dwight Evans made a circus catch. The pitch, there's a long shot to deep right, back goes Evans, back, back, and what a grab! Evans made a grab and saved the home run on that one. Here's the first for a double play. As Evans robbed Joe Morgan of a home run, jumping high in the air and snagging that ball out of the right field grandstand. The 35,000 fans at Fenway Park had hardly quieted down from Evans' defensive heroics when Carlton Fisk stepped up to lead off the 12th and gave Boston fans something to talk about all winter long. The 1-0 delivery to Fisk. He swings, long drive, left field. If it stays fair, it's gone. Home run! The Red Sox win! And the series is tied three games apiece. After that sudden death victory by Boston, a lot of teams would be down emotionally, but not the Reds. In Game 7, they found themselves down once again by a 3-0 count. But once again, they came fighting back. In the sixth, Bill Lee tried to use his EFAS curve on Tony Perez. It did not work. There's his blooper pitch. There it is. A high drive. He's waiting for that one. That one is gone over everything. Perez timed that blooper pitch and slammed it over the screen out in the Lansdowne Street. And now we have another one-run ball game in this World Series. Then in the seventh, with two on and two out, Pete Rose tied up the game. There's a line shot to center. Here's a man rounding third. Here comes the throw. It is not in time. The other runners advance, and the Reds have tied it, and have runners on second and third. Griffey scored easily. Lynn's throw was wide of the plate. Armbruster raced to third, and Rose went down to second on the throw to the plate. During the course of the season, it seemed as though the Reds owned a patent on scoring runs in the ninth inning. This was how they would win their third world championship. With runners on first and second, Joe Morgan looped a single to center field for what would be their most important run of the long 1975 season. Cincinnati, a two down, as Ken Griffey at third, Pete Rose at first, Joe Morgan at back, one ball, two strikes. There's a looper, they drop, 
It's in for a hit. Here comes a throw to third. Rose hits a dirty safe. And there goes Morgan down to second. And the Reds have the lead four to three. Then out of the bullpen came Will McEnany. And with quickness and dispatch, he retired the side. And Cincinnati had its first world championship since 1940. The Reds are one out away from winning the world championship. And Carl Yastrzemski gets a standing ovation. Win or lose, he's been a great player for Boston since 1960. And he's the captain of the team. There's a high fly ball. It should be all over. Geronimo's under it. And Cincinnati has won the world championship, beating the Boston Red Sox 4-3. to three. Thanks, Chateau, and congratulations to to the manager of the Reds, Sparky Anderson. What a wonderful moment for you. So you talk Milt. This one's for Milt, boys. And for Lefty, who's not here. And for all my friends and everybody I love. Thank Sparky you. Anderson, congratulations to you and the Reds. Joe Morgan. Joe Morgan, congratulations. Thank you very much, man. This is the one I've been looking for for 11 years, and I finally made it. Marty, you want to talk around you? Yes, sir. Joe, for the 115th time this season, this one belongs to the Reds, and it was a big one. Right on. This is the biggest one I've ever played in, Marty. We've come from behind. It looked like we were dead, but we never done it. Pete Rose, the man standing to my left, was named the most valuable player of the 1975 World Series, and Pete, our congratulations to you. It was strictly a team performance tonight. Most teams would have quit when they got us out when we had first and third no outs, Tony. We struck Toronto out and, and uh, Redmond hit to a double play. But most teams would have quit. We stood down by three runs and Perez gave us a line with a two-run shot. You can tell I'm hoarse from yelling the whole game. And <laughs> here's Johnny Bench. And it is, Marty. <laughs> I'm so excited. I, I really, uh, here's Bob Housen. We all made it all possible. And I'll tell you, it was just a complete effort. I've never wanted to win anything so bad. And the way we won it, I think, makes it even more exciting.